Hello, and welcome to another virtual author chat at the Poison Pen Bookstore. I'm John Charles, and today the Poison Pen is triply blessed to have with us three extremely talented writers, Ariel Lahan, Christina McMorris, and Susan Meisner, who are here to discuss their new book, When We Had Wings. Before we begin, I want to let those listening in know that the Poison Pen does have copies of the book on order, as well as some of the author's earlier titles, and we would be happy to hold them for you at the bookstore or put them in the mail. Just give us a call at the Poison Pen or go online, and we can connect you with these truly fabulous books. Now I'd like to welcome Ariel, Christina, and Susan. Hi. Hey, hey there. Hello. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you for being here virtually. Um, I always like to like to ask authors, maybe it's just me, but I think other readers are fascinated by kind of your backstory, who you were before you became literary superheroes. So if you can kind of tell us a little bit about your life before being a published writer, why don't we start with you, Ariel? Sure, absolutely. Mine is, I would have to put it into pieces, I guess. So immediately prior to um, publishing. I was a stay-at-home mom of four boys. My husband and I had four boys in five years, which wouldn't necessarily recommend. That was like super speed, but we love it. So I, during all those years before I published, I was practicing and I was writing and I was pursuing this dream because it is the only thing I have ever wanted to do prior to having all of the boys that have ever existed. I worked in a, I worked for a software development company here in Nashville. Nothing super fancy, was not very good at it, didn't like it. Um, and then prior to that, I was born and raised in Taos, New Mexico, in the okay. far wilds of nowhere at the end of a six mile dirt road. I used to say that uh, my childhood was sort of like Laura Ingalls meets the hippie movement. <laughs> That's me in a nutshell. That's fascinating. Christina, you've had a really interesting past life. <laughs> I feel like we're telling our like super, you said we were superheroes, right? We're, we're, I feel like we're telling our origin stories <laughs> at some point that we were saved and we saved the world. So um, so let's see here. Uh, you, as you know, Charles, uh, John, I've had like a weird hodgepodge of careers in the past. And, and so a couple of things, I guess, before I started writing, um, most immediately before that, I was an event and wedding planner. I did 14 weddings a summer, which like having four boys in five years, I do not recommend. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, but yay, made it through. We all survived. And, um, and yes, I've done a lot of YMCA and chicken dances, you know, enough for the rest of my life. <laughs> I'd like to joke. Um, I was a PR director for 12 years of a family business. So a conglomerate. So did that for a long time, hosted TV shows since I was nine years old. Uh, mm -hmm. there's a kid show called popcorn. It was like a kid's entertainment tonight, um, for education. And that was for ABC's affiliate in Oregon and Washington. So I did that from nine till 14, which is a very strange, but interesting childhood. I've got lots of stories and, um, and some of those of growing up, literally growing up in the newsroom, uh, is where I pulled from some of my stories that I put into sold on a Monday, um, as you know, that has a reporter in a newsroom. So some of that I got to use. Um, and then I hosted a show called weddings, Portland style for, uh, Warner brothers for WB for about five or six years. So all of that ended up leading to a much a calmer life. We, we joke, <laughs> it's not any more sane. That's for sure. Um, <laughs> Being an author, we just learned to take all the things from our lives and use them usefully. So, <laughs> uh, so now I am writing all because of a cookbook that I created for my grandmother, um, full of her recipes as a Christmas gift, and put her biographical section in the book. And she shared her courtship story with about my late grandfather, about the letters that they fell in love through, and that inspired my debut novel. And that's what I've been doing ever since. Full-time writer and full-time mom of two teenage boys who are, I like to say, 16 and 19 going on 40. So there you go. There's me in a nutshell. That's great. What about you, Susan? Well, I've always loved to write for as long as I can remember. And I think when I was making those big, important decisions when you're in high school about what to do with your life as an adult, I decided not to make writing a job because I was afraid I would grow to hate it. Because I saw people coming home from work on Fridays and they're tired and they hated Mondays. And I 
foolishly thought that if I made writing my job that I would I would grow to hate it like so many people I saw hated their jobs. That's not true. <laughs> <laughs> but it took me a while to figure that out. Um, we lived overseas for a little while, my husband and I, and we had children during those years. And when we came back to the United States in my early 30s and the kids were all in school, the local newspaper, it was a really small weekly newspaper in a county seat with had like 20,000 total residents in the entire county. They had an opening for a part-time reporter. And even though I did not have a journalism degree, uh, the applicant pool was kind of shallow there. <laughs> and so um, they gave me the job just based on writing samples that I gave them from just writing letters home to my mother while we were living in Europe. And I got the job that way. And because I was finally doing what I was wired to do all along, I did really well. And they ended up giving me lots and lots of promotions. So by the time 10 years had gone by, I was managing editor of a small weekly newspaper that the bigger newspaper owned. And so it, it was it was journalism that kind of um, gave me all the writing helps that I needed to start writing fiction. I didn't realize that journalism could do that for a fiction writer, but it can, and it did. And by the time I'd been at the newspaper for 10 years, I, I could not get rid of the restlessness that I had to write a novel. I'd had it since I was like, you know, in junior high school. And I finally just gave it a go and thought, you know, I'd, I'd rather see if I can do it than regret never having tried. And um, I finally found my wheelhouse. It was, it was writing fiction all along. And it didn't, it didn't happen until my 40s, but I'm really, really glad that I was given the chance um, to, to write that first novel because I've been doing it ever since and never looked back. I had read something, Susan, that you had written for another place that I found fascinating about your career in journalism. And I think what you had said was what well, writing real stuff as opposed to fiction did for me anything more than anything else was to open the depth with an intricacy of the human quilt. So I guess mm -hmm. working on obituaries kind of yes. led you to where you are now. That is true. Story. Yeah, and there were lots of feature stories on, on people. In fact, I interviewed a man who survived the Bataan Death March. And of course, his story comes back to me all the time, especially when we were writing this book um, because of where this book is set. But when you get a chance to interview people who have lived life on a different level than you, it, it does, it opens your eyes and it opens your um, the, the ability to experience kind of vicariously what someone else has gone through, which is what fiction does every time you pick up a, a novel and, and immerse yourself in it. That's true. Let's move on to your new book, which is why we're here, When We Had Wings. Um, it's an amazing book. It's not always an easy read, um, I'll tell people, because it's these people, your characters really, like the human people they're based on, suffered a great deal. But it's also a story about hope and resilience and friendship and things like that. So what can you tell us about When We Had Wings? Um, I'll jump in there and, and explain a little bit about the story, since you well know from reading it. It is essentially about three nurses, a U.S. Army, U.S. Navy, and a Filipina nurse, who all become fast friends in Manila in 1942. They are stationed there thinking they have a paradise assignment, really. And even the Filipina growing up there, you know, thinks that she is has moved to this big city and, and has a lot of excitement surrounding that until the Japanese forces, of course, attack, just like Pearl Harbor, the very next day they hit Manila and the Philippines, and then soon after invade. And so these women end up separated, sometimes crossing paths and going through incredible, just harrowing, conditions that they survive under the occupation, becoming some of the first female POWs of World War II. And the reason why we felt so strongly about telling their story is because when they got back to the U.S. and somehow survived all of the things they went through, starvation, you know, being POWs, um, every kind of tropical disease you can think of, and kept other people alive around them and risking their lives to do that, they were then told to not speak about their experiences by the U.S. government because I'm sure that the three of us will agree on this. The reason being most likely that the US government was very not very proud of the fact they had abandoned these women along with the service members with the Bataan Death March. And so they kind of did a promotional tour, we call it the victory tour with MacArthur, and then tucked away a lot of their experiences for a lot of their lives, many of them until the end of their lives. And some of them started telling their stories and memoirs. And that's why we're really excited to pass it along. Ariel or Susan, do you want to add to that or? Yes. Yeah, so the fascinating thing about this particular project is 
that we didn't get together and say, hey, let's write a novel. What are we going to write about? How are we going to do this? Instead, the publisher came to us and it was a very specific request that they were looking for a collaborative project by the three of us. And they said, we want you and we want you and we want you. We would love for it to be based in or around World War II. Off you go, figure something out. Mm -hmm. And once we decided that yes, we really did want to do a project together because we've known each other for years, we thought, well, what would that be? Like what, what story are we going to write? And I'll let Susan tell you a little bit in a minute about how we came to this particular novel, but it was from a creative standpoint, a really fascinating way to approach a book. There was no initial flash of idea. It was the three of us and what are we going to do? And of course, we all three have our solo careers. All three of us were on deadline for different books. And so we had this really fun, fascinating situation where we were toggling projects and passing pages back and forth and passing ideas and editing in real time. And this book came together in a way that was entirely different than anything the three of us had written before. So fantastic and fun and funny and also like, wow, they put us in a room and just shake and bake. Make your book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Susan idea. was the one that found the actual idea that we went forward with. Yeah, the idea actually came from a, just a Google deep dive. We were all looking for that idea. We wanted to find a historical event from World War II that hasn't already had bunches of books written about it. And we wanted to find some female um, characters you know, to base the to base the story on that had some sort of significant role and and that also hasn't had a whole lot of light thrown on it. And so um, to find to find that idea, um, we, we needed to start looking. And I happened to find a documentary on YouTube about the nicknamed military nurses, Angels of Baton. I'd never heard of these women before. I've only ever, ever heard of the Baton Death March. So I watched the documentary, found out about these amazing women, um, military nurses from the US and their Filipina um, counterparts and showed it to Ariel and Christina. And we kind of knew from the get go that was gonna be our backdrop because of the fact they were such remarkable women. They were real people and hardly anybody knows their story. And um, you know, sadly, all of, these, all of those women have passed on. The last one died in 2013, but um, we relied on a really great book, which I'm sure you can get at the Poison Pen it's called We Band of Angels. It's by Elizabeth M. Norman. She's a professor and a nurse herself, and her research her research is just amazing. And she was able to interview many of those women before they passed from this life. And so that was our go-to when we began this project. What were some of the challenges in doing the historical research? I know that at one point, one of you had mentioned finding information about the Filipina um, people involved was challenging, but were there other challenges? Did you find particularly good resources, whether in person, in print? Talk about research, the book. So there were not many biographies written about these women. Like Christina mentioned earlier, when these women came back from the war, they were told to sign basically non-disclosure agreements saying that they would not discuss their experiences during the war. So it was not until, I think it was late 90s that Elizabeth Norman's book was published. Mm -hmm. And that is when their stories really started coming out. So we had the Band of Angels, we had a couple memoirs that were written, but there's not a ton of material. Typically, when you approach a story set in World War II, you have an avalanche of material, you have books and maps and biographies and history books, we didn't have as much with this. So we had to really rely on the stories of the nurses themselves. There's a documentary, there are a few firsthand accounts. And when we dove into the story, it was what do these women have to say about the actual events that they lived? And that is what we built the story around. Hmm. And I'll add to that too, as you just said, on the uh, finding any information about those nurses were, were difficult, but finding them about the Filipina nurses um, were, was even harder. As the three of us know, when we read through some of the books the, that we, what we did and research, we thought the Filipina nurses are mentioned, but then you never have, not once did I find in the books that we had read, like We Band of Angels, that, that they were interviewed. 
Um, and so they didn't have any quotes to pull from. So there was uh, another book. Um, and Susan, thankfully, sent, uh, had passed that along to me. Do you remember the, the exact title? I think it's the, the I'm gonna... Indomitable Florence Finch. <laughs> yes, yes. And I'm terrible with that word. <laughs> it's like Indomitable <laughs> um, Florence Finch, who happened to be exactly like my character, which is a mestiza, being half Filipina and half American or half Caucasian and, and being half Japanese myself and trying to figure out as a kid, which world do I belong in and kind of riding between the two and having those lines blurred, I thought was, it, it was just, it was a really good fit with that character. And so finding um, that book was incredible and it spoke to a lot of that, but otherwise, yeah, finding information about these women was really hard. And we had to kind of sometimes too, as we all know, the information sometimes wasn't um, consistent. Mm -hmm. And so you had different dates. You remember that different dates mm -hmm. and different years and different counts of how many nurses were sent here and how many survived here. And, and we had to kind of do the best we could um, with reconciling that. Yeah, I was very fortunate to find a biographical work on one of the Navy nurses. Her name was Dorothy Still. And someone had written her, um, her biography about this time in her life. I'm very grateful for that because there were only a dozen Navy nurses compared with the more than 80 Army nurses. And they, um, their experience is different. They were never on baton. So they, they are part of this amazing group of women, but their stories are even lesser known. So I was very grateful uh, that, that the, her biography had been written, which is um, all, all to say, if you've experienced something amazing, you really should write it down so that future people can read your work and be amazed by you. <laughs> Yes, help other authors, yes, please yes. help us in the future. <laughs> and, and leave your legacy, your literary legacy. Only, only you know the story you've lived. Um, write it down for future generations. I don't think you'll regret it. One of the things that we talked about quite a bit as we were writing and compiling this story is that each of our characters, we probably could have written a novel about their experiences alone. Each of these women, the army nurses, the Navy nurses, the Filipino nurses, they all have this en enormous story. And you'd asked earlier what one of the challenges was. And honestly, one of the biggest challenges was winnowing down these three big stories into one concise story and hitting the high points for all of them in such a way that you felt like you experienced the whole thing through the three of them. So did each of you pick one of the main characters then? Is that how the book was written? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. After the documentary that Susan sent to us, which was fantastic, I remember I, before we had, we knew that we wanted to write about them then. And I thought, well, I'll watch the documentary and just start taking notes. And it, And then I got so excited because I thought, oh my gosh, there are three types of nurses. What are the chances? And one of them, you know, being Asian, so hello. And then, <laughs> so then the other two just came out so naturally. And Susan could tell you more too about her ties with the Navy. And so mm -hmm. that was a perfect fit. And then of course, Ariel can touch upon also her character, Penny, being a Texan and all of her ties to Texas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was pretty easy once we decided this was our backdrop, which nurse we would like to write about. And we knew each one of us would take one of those women, an, an army nurse, a Navy nurse, and a Filipina nurse working for the American Army. And I'm um, I'm from San Diego. It's a, it's a Navy town. My father-in-law was a career naval officer, and my son was in the Navy. So it was a natural fit for me to write the character of Eleanor, who is the Navy nurse. Same with me. In, in a lot of ways, it really felt as though it was meant to be. that These pieces came together seamlessly. My character is Penny Franklin. She's a Texas Army nurse. My parents are Texan. My husband is Texan. Two of our four kids are Texan. But more than that, my father was United States Army. He served as military police during Vietnam. And my grandfather was a lieutenant colonel during World War II with the United States Army. And so there's this I understand Texas, I understand the Army, I have great respect for both of those things, and it was really fun to create this character out of whole cloth that was all of those things. And what can you tell us about your character, Christina? Um, so with Lita being that it was fantastic because I got to name her actually after 
kind of, I, I won't say like a second mom, but she was like, an, she's still an auntie to me. So, you know, within the Philippines, we call the titas and, and my best friends growing up were all Filipina. And I will say anybody that knows Filipino people, if you're friends with one, you were never friends with one Filipino person, right? You are close friends with then many um, because the families tend to live near each other. They, I remember them telling me, oh, we'll go visit my aunt and uncle. I'm like, oh, how far is that? We're going to walk. I thought, well, how far is the walk? They said, oh, it's a block away. <laughs> and you find out they all live within like a four block radius and and every holiday, it was just an excuse to get together. You know, you start cooking, uh, they'd cook for days and then you just sit and graze all day long with their amazing food, like um, lumpia and leche flan and all these things that we got to put into the story. And there's even a time that I said, Susan, I know you mentioned lumpia in there, but can I steal that please? Cause that was my childhood. She's like, oh, sure you can have it. I'm like, oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, so for me, you know, Lita was named after Angelita, which was my best friend's mother, and we still call her Lita. Um, and so I got to go to my Filipina friends and ask them for making sure that my my cultural references were right, you know, the, that the nurses' uh, references were correct, and that so many of their cousins and aunts that they're all they're all nurses. Um, this community, the Filipino community, is you know so entrenched in the in the nursing community and giving to other people. They're just incredible as a culture, and so that was fun. And I got to borrow all of their cousin names. <laughs> so every na Filipino name I have in the story, um, yes, is borrowed from somebody. So thank you, thank you for that family. Even though you don't, I made them all nice people though. So don't worry. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about the process of writing the book, because if I understand correctly, the initial project started during the first phases of the pandemic. So you really couldn't like get together. Everyone was isolated. How do three writers who probably have their own unique approaches to the process of writing manage to turn out a book without one of them ending up somewhere else? Well, we kind question. of we kind of knew the story of the the real story of these nurses. So there was that, like the plot. We didn't have to come up with the plot of what happens when because the the story is there. It's true, and we also knew that these nurses spent a lot of time not together. They okay. they may have been together in Manila before um, the fall of the islands to the Japanese, but we or we already knew they spent much time separated. So I was able to write my my chapters first. So I could, I could write Eleanor's chapters based on the Navy nurses' experiences. And I knew that I could only write 30 to 35,000 words because we had a, a word limit and we wanted the stories to be evenly weighted. And that's what, that's what I did. It. I wrote my chapters first and then um, Ariel wrote hers, Christina's wrote hers last. And then we started the, the harder work of making sure everything dovetailed together. And that when those women were together, that we had to work on those chapters together on a Google Doc because there were times when... They were all in the same room and there were times when two of them were in the same room and then a great deal of time when they were completely separated from each other. Yeah. One of the things that was really helpful that we couldn't have planned is just geographically where my character spent the majority of the war happened to be a place where the other characters came in and out. So it provided this hinge and sense of connectivity. So even you couldn't get all three of them together at once necessarily, but we were able to consistently throughout the novel have them brush up against one another and reconnect that friendship and catch each other up on things that the characters wouldn't have known otherwise. So in, in a way, it actually worked out really well for me to do my part of the novel second because I could come in, see where Susan had been, see where her character was and where she was going, write my parts somewhat around that, but also connect it and then leave the door open for my character to interact with Christina's character later as well. And I'll say that I was, so I was the third one. I was the caboose and, um, and I was already behind on my deadline for the ways we hide. And so, so when I came in, it was at the very end and that's when I had finally the opening to write to write my section. And, and I, I'll probably liken it. I, I used to golf quite a bit pre-kids um, when you have all that free time, you know, five hours on a Saturday, whenever you want. Um, and I, so I, I would probably liken it to thinking, you know, when I started, I thought, oh yeah, we talked about outline. No problem. My story is just a straight fairway. This is easy. Okay. I can see the goal. No problem. I'll write all the, the I'll do the strokes in between. And then by the time that it came to me, rightfully so there were, you know, all of a sudden I'm like, wait a minute, that sand trap wasn't there <laughs> before, you know, I'm like that pond wasn't there. And all of a sudden it's curving. And I thought, okay, how do I do this? It was, 
such a good challenge in the best of ways um, and trying to interweave and, and really something new, which is why part of why the three of us wanted to do this was for a new challenge, something we hadn't done before. And so being able to come in and then think, wait a minute, okay, that last chapter before mine, um, I've left mine with a cliffhanger, but I don't get back to my character for eight months because of necessity because of things that happen very quickly in another character's chapter. And so you think, how do I connect a cliffhanger eight months later? And in the shower where I have my, my best thoughts because it's quiet and everybody leaves me alone. Um, <laughs> I, I, Ariel wouldn't understand that, right? Um, so then that's when I came up with some of my best solutions and I was very excited to be able to solve that. And, and it was very fulfilling besides the fact that we get to tell these women's really important stories. I think that's, um, I'm glad you mentioned that because I want to pick up on that thread, Christina. You are telling history from a women's viewpoint. <clears throat> and Ariel had written something, and I'm going to look at it to make sure I get it right, that I thought was really profound. And what she, you had said, Ariel, was I have always said that if you study history and you want to know what really happened, go talk to the women who were there. Go talk to uh -huh. the women who lived through it because they remember the small moments. And that was, that's what comes across in the story. It, it, it's true though, when when biographers write a, the story of war, typically they're writing about the battles and the bullets and the bombs and these huge moments that rightfully need to be remembered. But we forget that war is about people. It's always about people. It's about sorrow and it's about loss and it's about the small betrayals. And that's true of history in general, not just war, which is the subject of this particular book. but. I think women remember things that men don't typically remember. They remember the relational cost, the emotional cost, and I think that is what makes a story fulfilling in the end. Definitely. Um, it really comes across in all of your characters. You've done so much research on this time period for this book and for your other books. What surprised you the most after you finished writing this book about um, baton about World War II in the Pacific. Was there something that you thought, wow, I never would have realized this if I hadn't worked on this project? Hmm. That's a good question. Yeah, I, well, it, I, go ahead. I, I was going to say, I remain astonished um, that we were not allowed to hear these women's stories. It is, it's, it's unconscionable to me that a person can serve as an officer in the military go halfway across the world, survive a war, come home and be told, yeah, no, you don't get, you don't get to talk about that. We don't want you talking about that. Um, and it really does make you wonder what other stories are lost for similar reasons. Yeah, I was struck by the, um, the sure amount of PTSD that these women experienced when they returned home that was never addressed because when they were brought home, it was almost like, let's let them have their makeup and cosmetics back. Like, like that's what they missed when they were incarcerated and, and treated subhumanly. That's what they missed was their lipstick and curlers. And so they kind of put them on this tour. Welcome home. Thanks for your service. Um, hope you enjoy having curlers and lipstick again. It was like nobody really wanted to talk about what they really experienced and how that affected them because Dorothy still in one of her writings said, we all probably had post-traumatic stress syndrome and, and nobody thought about it or addressed it. And so they never got a chance to really um, work through that. Like we know is, is so unnecessary to do when you experience trauma like that. I think this couple of things that come to mind that surprised me the most, aside from, as they said, just that these women rightfully named the angels of Bataan, you know, dubbed that by the servicemen, um, which by the way, in case we didn't make that very clear, which is where our title comes from when we had wings. So that's that's obviously where it, where it stemmed from. A couple of things that surprised me the most were just uh, the tropical diseases that all of these women went through, uh, the starvation, um, that they were 80 pounds, some of them, when they came home afterward. Um, and then also just going through even the Filipino people, um, for me, since that was my focus, uh, learning about the guerrillas that, you know, that the Filipino people that fought alongside them. We learned about the Filipino, the uh, the massacre 
in Manila Massacre is what they called it, which we were all stunned, I think, right, the three of us, when we learned about the details of that. It's one of these horrendous things, and I won't go into detail now, uh, but you'll find about, out about it in the story. And it's one of those details of history that should be, that we should all know about. Just stunning that we have not heard about this before. So those are those those little tidbits that we came across. And um, I think there was one more thing I was going to share about the Philippines that I was so excited about. And I'll have to circle back around. But I think one of them, too, was about nursing, actually, about not realizing that so many Filipino people are in the nursing community. I somehow missed this. Um, I don't know how. But when we learned about the nursing system with uh, in the Philippines and how that was a great immigration system that was set up by the U.S. after they colonized, and so it was a nice channel for the Filipino people to immigrate. And because of that, we have so many um, nurses who are Filipino in this country, which is just incredible. Yeah, your character, I think it was her four older sisters had all immigrated to the U.S. and were nurses. Yeah, and that's very common, incredibly common, and still to this day, it's very common. Um, let's go a little bit broader and talk about writing historical fiction um, for each of you, not just your current project, but your previous novels. How do you find the right balance between historical details that are necessary to the story, what you want to write that might be a little bit more imagined or realized. Um, I always remember, Christina, you have what you call your literary Advil, historical Advil theory, what I call historical it. fiction. Yeah, and that you get the, the, if you haven't heard me say that before, John knows, I say historical fiction is literary Advil, and that you get a sugar coating of a story on the outside, and hopefully you don't realize how much good stuff in history get on the inside until it's over, and then we all hope as writers that you look back and think, wow, I actually learned a lot too, which is one of the best things that we do. Yeah, for me, the historical aspect of what I write is very important to me, and accuracy is, it's a stickler with me, mainly because I feel like I'm making a promise to my reader that if you're reading my, one of my books, um, I'm, I'm giving you how it really happened. Um, it could have happened just like this to the, my character because it really happened to somebody else. And so I, I do sp spend a fair amount of time making sure I've got it right. Um, if I have to fudge on something that actually happened in history, I always make a, a note in the author's note to explain why I took such a liberty with the actual facts. But I, if I'm going to have to make some sort of um, bargain with history, it's always for the good of the story. I never do it to make it easier to tell the story or easier for you to hear it. Is it, is, is it for the good of the story that I have to um, take some license here? And if it's not good for the story and it's only for the ease of me or some other easy way out, then I don't do it. And uh, because I, I do want you to feel like if you read one of my books, um, the historical part of it is as accurate as, as I can make it for a work of fiction. And it's same for me. One of my favorite quotes about history is uh, the Rudyard Kipling quote, if history were told in the form of stories, it would never be forgotten. So for me, when I write these books, I'm telling a story that I think people should remember. Sometimes it's about a specific person, like with my last book, but sometimes it's about a time period or something that happened. And I always try to be as accurate as I can. Um, occasionally, you have to condense timelines, you have to rearrange things. But like Susan, I fess up to that at the end as well. Trying to remember that I'm telling a story. I'm not writing a history book. I'm not writing a biography. This is not narrative nonfiction. It is fiction. And so in the service of the story, I will sort through extraneous things and make sure that the heart has stayed intact. But I think it's important. I think it's important that we know these stories, that we remember them, that if somebody asks, can you tell me a little bit about the Angels of Bataan? We can go, oh, oh yeah. yes, <laughs> because I read this really great book and this happened and this happened and there were three kinds of nurses and they were spread here and here. And at the end, specifically with Wings, anybody that reads this is going to have a general understanding of what happened to those women and hopefully be really curious and then go dig in a little bit more and find the harder, deeper, longer, meatier biographies that really get into the politics and the war and what was going on geopolitically as well. 
And we're often asked to, you know, how do you know when to stop researching, right? Does you all get that question? How do you know when to stop and start writing the story? And, and I think what we have to do is, I know myself and then the three of us for this book, we plotted. You know, I think for historical authors, I, I, I can't imagine it doing it any other way um, because there is just so much research that you could go down a million rabbit holes if you don't really know where you're going. And then I think that helps shape the story as mm -hmm. well. And I will say that I don't believe I did that at all with when we had wings. I know with um, I know we've all encountered this before in the past of our, our past books. I know with the ways we hide with my last book, I did come across a piece of history that I absolutely wanted to tell a tragedy called the Italian Hall disaster. And I was so stunned by it that very often the three of us will come across something like, how do we not know this? People need to know this happened. Um, and so we get to put it into our stories. In that case, I could not reconcile it uh, with World War II. And so given it was the same character that gone through both, I thought, how do I do this? And what I did as a solution there, which I, I know I'm just giving an example of things that we do, I had then created a fictional town that was fashioned after that tragedy, that town. So everything else is accurate. But then I felt like I could take a little more liberty and also, you know, still tell their story and explain in the author's note that that, you know, that it was inspired by this um, so that I wasn't taking a bunch of, I'd rather do that than change the dates by years of, of something that happened in real life. So that's some of the things that I think that we do, that we try to find that balance between fact and fiction, serving the story, but also being true to history. I always tell myself, particularly at the end of a deadline as well, books are never done. They're just due. Like <laughs> you have to turn them in, you have to hand it over, but they will never, ever be done. And if you leave me to my own devices, I'm going to have a 10,000 page novel that covers millennia. So the deadline is helpful. So are the bookends of when a book takes place. Yeah. And for me, I always set a date for when I'm going to begin writing. It doesn't mean I have to stop re researching that day, but it does mean I do have to start writing because research is fun and writing is hard. And if I didn't have that date on my calendar, I might just say, oh, I'm not done researching. I, there's still more. There's always going to be more. You're never done. So I, it, for me, it's a date to start and that keeps me on, keeps me on task. Yeah, absolutely. I actually have a novella that's coming out next Christmas. It's repackaged from a past publisher. And I, I told the gals today, I my job is to go through and I'm tweaking because again, like you think, oh, that could be better and that could be better. And I thought of Ariel's quote. And as I was going through that today, like, yep, they're never done. They're only due. <laughs> <laughs> so true. What is your actual process as a writer like? Because I know for many authors, it's always different. And if I'm remembering correctly, Christine, at one point she had a post-it approach to writing. I did. I did. And I've taken a little break from the post-its, but I have nothing against them. They will come back in my life when it's time. Um, so it, I just have a, a foam core board or, you know, cardboard poster and put up for, I think about the, my first five novels, um, just a mini post-it on each one that it, that uh, represented each one represents a chapter. So just a few words on it that let me know that it absolutely has to be in the book. Even if the reader doesn't know why it's there, I know that it absolutely has to be there, that it will pay off at some point. Um, and it all sets the foundation for everything. So especially helpful um, with my first couple novels when I had alternating points of view. So having each one a different color and making sure that they were sort of rotating and, you know, who is getting more stage time and and so that was really helpful and then later with a, a book the pieces we keep it had a mystery element that bound the past and the present so knowing when those mystery elements were being exposed to the reader in in a time that a timely manner that made sense to them uh, was really helpful so now yeah I think this time I just had to I was such a hurry to get to the book <laughs> I was excited <laughs> and deadline that everything with 2020 I think we all just threw out our rule books <laughs> <laughs> in every part of our lives. And I just went, I'm just writing this on Word and just did a quick outline and jumped in. And, and so, yes, that's where I am right now. <laughs> yeah, for me, it's almost changed with every book. And I know some people say they settle into a method that works for them and that's their method all the time. But, you know, sometimes I'll use index cards when I'm doing research and I'll, I'll, write, I'll write something on an index card based on color for what part of the book it fits. Um, I didn't do that for this one. I um, did not do it for the book I have coming out in April. I think because the subject matter was just huge, I would have had too many index cards and it would have been, there just would have been too many index cards. And so, you know, then it became a notebook where I had sections of, of the different 
elements of the book that were gonna that were gonna come out. And I think that's the kind of the cool thing about writing and that we discovered during a collaboration is there is not one way to write a book. There are many ways, many successful ways. We came into the collaboration with our own different ways, but we still produced a fantastic book that we're all really proud of. And it was combining all of our own ways of, of writing a book. And which is to say that if, if you're a writer and you're struggling to adopt a method, well, don't worry about the method. Just go with the way that works for the book because the next book you write might be a completely different method. I mean, yes, and to segue off of what Susan says, I, I say this with writing books. People always say, what, what's a great book about writing that I should read? And I think it also works for process as well. If you find something that works, stick with that and just forget about everything else. It's kind of like stop looking for a wedding dress once you've found the one, <laughs> like just stop. <laughs> if something works, buy it and commit. Mm -hmm. And the thing that works for me, I have done this since my first novel is I, I, I draft in Scrivener. Um, and I love it because you can move things around. There's no cutting and pasting. I can shuffle. I can see the entire story as a whole on my screen. And I learned this a few years ago, you can add emojis to Scrivener. And so I can add a little check mark every time I finish a scene. I can put a little figurine for whatever character that is. One book I had uh, my, with my last book, uh, my book about Nancy Wake, she was a shot glass with, with brandy in it. And anytime I saw that shot glass, I'm like, oh, well, this is Nancy during this section of her life. And it gives me a visual board to work from. And I don't know, I find it really satisfying to tick things off a list. And so my office is filled with papers, but I can keep every list. I can keep every idea right there on the screen and I can work through it. And then of course it comes time to give it to my editor and I have to put it all in word and I let Scrivener go at that point. But it works, it works for me and I don't want to exhaust myself. So I know the thing that I can do to make sure I get the book done. Do you still find that Anatomy of Story, the book that you often reference, is um, useful? Yes. I still buy a new copy every time I start a novel to work through it. And I found out yesterday that John Truby has a new book coming out, and it's called Anatomy of Genres. And so he breaks it down mm. genre by genre. So instead of the overall thing that he does, it's genre. And I have already pre-ordered my copy because I cannot wait to get it. But it's the thing that works for me. I've recommended that book to many people. Some love it, some don't. If you don't love it, find the one that works because the goal is always a finished book. The goal is to write the story and be done. And so use the tools that help you get to that point. There are no rules. Let's talk a little bit about you as readers because you're all writers. What are the books or book that got you hooked as a reader on historical fiction? Well, for me, it was Barbara Kingsolver's The Poisonwood Bible. I read that book a zillion years ago, probably when it first came out, and I was just undone by it. It's a sad book, um, but it's just brilliantly constructed. And um, I think I've read it over the past two decades, probably three or four, maybe five times. And um, I told myself at the very beginning that someday I want to write a book like that. So it was always, for me, it was a, a book that I've held up as something to aspire to. If you've never read a Poise, The Poisonwood Bible by Barbara King Solver, I highly recommend it. I'm sure you can get it for your patrons. But it's a book set in the Congo during a very difficult time in the 1970s. And it's the story of a mother and her four daughters and the father figure who was um, not a great person. And they're in this very, very hostile environment, beautiful, but hostile. And it takes them through um, these girls' lives when they're young up until their, their adult years. It just, it's a fantastic novel of, hist of historical fiction set during the 1970s Congo. For me, it was with uh, Letters from Home. Um, I had finished writing that novel. So of course, as I said, that was inspired by my grandparents. So that was a personal reason that I wrote that. I sold it in a two book deal. And so, you know, it's just great news when you want to stay employed. It's not great news when you only plan to write one book ever. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm like, I'm so unlike these two. Um, yeah. So I went, oh, what do I write about? And I 
thought, you know what, I'm going to write a contemporary story. Won't that be smart? And my family all agreed. Yes, that'd be so smart. You know, you get paid the same and, you know, supposedly half the work, right? So, um, so I went ahead and thought I was going to do a contemporary kind of a bit of a mystery and a little bit of the past, but nothing like World War II. And then I read Water for Elephants by Sarah Gruen. And I had had that recommended by so many friends that it became almost like she's paying them. <laughs> so <laughs> it was like, you have to read this. You have to read this. And I'm like, oh, you know, so they say it's a page turner, I swear. And, and then as anybody knows, who knows the, the gist of the story, when it sounds, when, it, when you just hear a little bit of the premise, they're like, it's a page turner. It's, you know, about this elderly man in a nursing home recounting his life completely in backstory in the circus. And I thought, that is not a page turner because <laughs> I hadn't read a word, but I could tell you no. And then it was a snow day and I was cooking and I thought for the kids and they were playing outside, I thought, and a friend of mine, she had literally said, I'm buying this for you because you were going to read it. So I went, oh, fine. so I had nothing else to read that day. Okay, fine. I couldn't put it down. Every time I was stirring, I was reading at the same time. And I remember thinking after I finished that book and loved it. And I thought, you know what, no other genre, I love so many other, reading other genres, but no other genre immerses me in another world like historical fiction does, that I just completely lose track of where I am and step into another time and then learn, which I love so much too. So that's the reason why I stuck with it ever since. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say there were three books in the lead up to writing my first novel that changed everything and made me huge fans of historical fiction. First is Water for Elephants, which by the way has the most satisfying ending probably of any novel I've that ever written. That is so by. true, yes. Um, the second is The Thirteenth Tale by Diane Setterfield, and then the third was Outlander by Diana Gabaldon. And all three of them, they're so smart and they're so good and they're all kind of ruthless just a little bit. There's nobody's pulling punches and they're immersive and you feel, when you finish those stories, you close the book and you feel like you were the one that just lived it, like mm. they sweep you away. And I was already attempting to write a historical novel at the time, but I read those three and I thought, this is it, this is the thing I want to do. If I can do something like that, then I win. I win it all. And that's what I've been trying to do ever since. That's great. Um, if you, I know when we had wings just came out, but if you Tuesday, buy, like Tuesday. Tuesday, actually, no, I guess I won't say that I have a copy. So in case your publisher finds out, or <laughs> um, but would you like to share anything about what's next possibly in the works for you as an author, what readers can look forward to? You want to start Susan? Sure. Well, my next book is a solo work. It comes out in April, um, April 18th, actually, 2023. It's called Only the Beautiful. It's got a gorgeous cover. Oh. And it's, yeah, isn't it? It's terrific. Um, so pretty. And what I like about it most is it's got the, the beautiful floral around the edges, but that tobacco sky suggests that not, not, not everything oh. is right. And what it's about is two women who are impacted by the eugenics movement of the early 20th century. One is a young woman living in Northern California in, the, in wine country in the 1930s. And the other is an American expat working as a nanny in Nazi occupied Vienna. And uh, the eugenics movement, we don't hear much about it anymore, which is a good thing. It went by the wayside. It was a terrible idea that was, you could not execute it without being um, terribly cruel. And most people don't know that the eugenics movement was alive and well here in the United States before Adolf Hitler ever came to power with his brand of eugenic thinking. And what eugenic thinking is, is let's just have only perfect, beautiful people. Let's have um, a world full of perfect people so that we can cut down on crime and indigence and poverty and all those social ills that we don't like. But the only way to execute that idea is to be um, unkind to a whole bunch of people you feel aren't as good as you, which is um, eugenic thinking at its um, terrible heart. So I, I don't leave you without hope though. I don't sugarcoat anything that happened during that real time in history, um, but I don't leave you without hope. I'm really happy with this book. It, it hits shelves in April of 2023. My next does not come out until November of 2023, but it is, I just finished, I just turned it in. <laughs> I think it's done. Um, it's called The Frozen River, and it is inspired by the life and diary of a woman named Martha Ballard, who was a midwife in late 1790s Maine. She was 
an astonishing woman who delivered over a thousand babies over the course of her career and never lost a mother, um, which is fascinating. I don't think modern doctors today can boast a record like that. But what's most fascinating to me about her is that over the 30 years of her career, she kept a diary at a time when most women could not read or write. And in this diary, which I have a copy of, oh. is recorded every birth, every death, every scandal, every murder, everything that happened in her small community during that time. And in its pages tucked away is the only written record that we have of a rape trial that completely changed the legal system in our country. So the novel, is mainly a murder mystery, but the uh, the real rape trial runs underneath and it's set over the course of one long, cold winter in this community. And Martha, our midwife, solves this murder that completely unhinges her small community. So for me, it's right behind your head there, John. <laughs> Directly above, like a halo um, called The Ways We Hide that I just mentioned. And I think it's actually like right behind me right here. Um, uh, just came out. So September 6th. So as you know, I got to come and visit you in person, which was so exciting on my insane tour. That was what, 18 flights in 14 days. And I'm standing, I'm still surviving. So, you know what? I know those nurses were brave, but come on, 18 flights. <laughs> <laughs> I can do anything. Um, so the gist of that story, as you know, is it um, is about a female American illusionist. She is the daughter of Dutch immigrants in 1942, and she is the mastermind behind an escape show. And because of this, now she has these incredible escape skill set that she has acquired because of a tragedy that I mentioned earlier called the Italian Hall disaster up in Michigan's Copper Country, which was a tragedy I was stunned I'd never heard about before. And because of her unique skills, she is recruited by British military intelligence group called MI9. So I like to say we're all familiar with MI5 and 6, right? We all nod. Yes, we've all seen Mission Impossible. Well, MI9 is what I call the go-go gadget team of British intelligence in World War II. They created escape and evade devices that they smuggled into almost anything you can think of, including Monopoly boards, which was one of those fun facts that I held onto for years, not realizing it could be um, it plays such an important part of a novel. And they would smuggle those into allied POW camps so that they could help them escape and also give all these tools to allied airmen who were downed in occupied territory. And so because of working with this group, my character gets pulled much deeper into the war than she ever expects. And so I am really excited that it's out in the world. These gals know that's why I did not get to, um, I had to be the caboose on this, on the campaigns <laughs> because I was, this book just became um, much more entailed as far as complexity with story, characters, and research, which John and I have talked about um, in person and, and interviewed wise. Enough research, talk about research, enough research for three books combined. So I'm very excited that's out there. And then other than that, I'll just say my sister and I, uh, she's an incredible artist, and we have a, uh, a two book deal, the picture book deal. So mm -hmm. our first one called Ellie Mae Dreams Big is coming out next fall. Um, so we're excited about right in time for Christmas and we can't wait to do events together because we actually like each other even <laughs> after we finish the book, which is incredible for sisters. Um, and then I'm doing an, uh, an Amazon original short coming up for Mother's Day um, and then working on the next novel. So yeah, we'll be all three of us will be pretty busy for a while. <laughs> um, well, before we run out of time and I can't believe how quickly it's flown by. Can you let uh, those listening in know how they can learn more about you and your books, um, what social media platforms you're on? Do you have websites? All the details. Absolutely. Um, for me, I have a website, ariellawhon.com. I am on all of the socials, all of my books, all of my everything are actually right there on the website. So if you want to visit there, I have a newsletter. Um, I think we're all really easy to keep up with. Yep, same for me. I, my um, website is susanmeisnerauthor.com and all of my socials you can get very easily from the website. And I also have a newsletter that I only put out every um, quarter. So it's just four times a year. It's super easy to subscribe to that so that we can stay in touch. And same for me, website, christinamcmorris.com and has all of the socials on there. I'm often on Instagram and Facebook. 
um, and also have we all have some fun um, features on our websites, you know, for book clubs, and we all are happy to Zoom. Sometimes we even Zoom together, which is going to be very fun. Mm -hmm. And I'll mention too that we have a couple other events in case, um, depending on when people are seeing this. Um, hopefully, it'll be coming up, or you know, or you could still get copies like from Poison Pen, of course, um, mm -hmm. and you can find out some more about that. So we'll be uh, doing a little mini tour. So you can look at our websites and check out those events too. And also virtually. So some more events mm -hmm. like that. That's great. Um, um, before we conclude, I want to let everyone know that When We Had Wings truly is an amazing book. It's a book you'll remember um, for many different reasons. I want to thank Ariel, Christina, and Susan for taking time to be with us virtually today. I want to thank those tuning in for listening to another virtual author chat with The Poison Pen. Thank you. <laughs>